start talking about Nietzsche on Monday. I put a handout on Nietzsche up on Blackboard. It's basically a whole bunch of quotes from other works by Nietzsche, um, that some of which I'll be referring to um, when we have the uh, introduction on Mondays, or try to situate the genealogy that uh, we'll be reading. Some of which I won't be talking about, um, but you might find interesting anyway. Uh, so over the weekend, in addition to finishing your Kant papers, obviously, um, download and print out those quotes and bring them to class on Monday. There's no other reading assignment. You don't have to get started with the genealogy yet. Okay. Uh, sadly, I'm not going to go in, be able to go into much detail about the metaphysics of morals, um, the doctrine of right and the doctrine of virtue, but today I'll make a few general points about them. And most importantly, I want to um, try to get clear on the different questions that Kant asks in these two different books, these two parts of the metaphysics of morals. Okay. In the groundwork, we saw Kant argues that moral assessments depend not only on the, let's say, outward expression of an action, on what somebody does externally, so to speak, but also moral assessments depend on what he calls the incentive for that action. In other words, why someone takes that action to be good is relevant to our moral assessment um, of the action and the person. So there's a crucial difference in, for example, um, the discussion of the shopkeeper. There's a crucial difference in our moral assessment of the shopkeeper who charges a fair price depending on why he doesn't. So our moral assessment is going to depend in part on whether he charges a fair price because it's in his long-term self-interest or because he recognizes that it's his duty to charge a fair price. So in the latter case, if he's doing it because it's his duty, from duty comes merely in accordance with uh, in the last case, if he's asking from duty, um, maybe he recognizes that if he were to um, um, charge a person, a knight, a child, or someone who doesn't know better, more money, um, this would be maybe using that person as a means only, rather than treating them as an end in, end in themselves. Um, if he were to trick somebody into paying more, for example. Or maybe he just thinks that doing that would be unfair. So I want to say that for Kant, that, of course, is good enough. In other words, if what's going on in his thinking, so to speak, is the thought that that would be unfair to charge more for that person. Well, that's good enough. In other words, we don't need to, Kant doesn't think we need to be experts on Kant or the categorical imperative in order to be virtuous people. Right? The recognition that something would be unfair, if that's the reason you avoid doing that thing, that's what virtue consists of. Okay, so all of this is correct, what I've just said. That for Kant, the reason why somebody uh, engages in action matters. It's not simply a matter of the outward external manifestation of that act. In, in those two cases, we can imagine the outward behavior, charging a fair price, is the same, but done for different reasons. The different reasons are relevant to our moral assessment. Clear? Familiar? Yes. yes. Good, thank you. All right, so all of this is right. Uh, and in the metaphysics of morals, Kant continues to make that same point, uh, that the incentive or end 
matters for our assessment of the morality of an action or the morality of a person uh, who um, performs that action. But it does not matter for our assessment of the justice of the act. It does not matter for our assessment of the rightness of the act, whether their act is correct. Um, so for that purpose, for assessment of the justice of an act, we precisely don't need to look at the incentive. We don't need to look at the maxim. We don't need to look at what the person's end was in performing that action, or why that person took that action to be good. Um, so on page 20, like the division in metaphysics and morals, it says the mere conformity or nonconformity of an action with law, irrespective of the incentive to it, is called its legality or lawfulness or correct or right. But that conformity in which the idea of duty arising from the law is also the incentive, in other words, someone who acts in that way lightly, because they recognize it to be right, that's the reason, uh, is also the incentive to the action is called its morality. Okay, so we have a d distinction here between the justice or rightness, uh, lawfulness of an action, which abstracts away from the incentive or the reason or the end that a person has in that way just looks at the external manifestation of the action. Distinction between that and the full-blown moral assessment of the action, which takes that into consideration. Um, so, on 21, when it comes to rightful action, he says um, this can only concern, quote, external duties, since the law, this law given does not require that the idea of this duty, which is internal, itself be the determining ground of the agent's choice. On the other hand, further down, ethical lawgiving, as opposed to justice, morality, while it also makes internal actions duties, does not exclude external actions, but applies to everything that is a duty in general. So in other words, um, uh, ethics, and what we've been talking about encompasses all of our duties, um, but the source of some of the duties of morality, the source of some of these, comes from simply external logic. So, um, uh, here's this example. Um, This is right at 220. He says, uh, the giving of the law that promises agreed to must be kept. So the moral requirement that we keep our promises. Lies not in ethics, but in use, that is in justice. So the requirement that we, sort of the source of the requirement that we keep our promises is a matter of right, is a matter of justice. All that ethics then teaches is that if the, so, sorry, so, uh, so what's required as a matter of justice is simply that we keep our promises. That if we break our promises, if we do something contrary to our promise, what we've done is wrong. It's a violation of right, a violation of someone else's right. And notice that the keeping or breaking of our promises is what justice is, is a matter of justice. Doesn't matter why we keep our, or break our promises. As long as we keep our promises, as long as we don't violate our promises in our external behavior, 
doing what we said we would do. Doesn't matter what the incentive is. Doesn't matter the reason why. That is, doesn't matter for the purposes of determining whether we've acted justly or not. Is that clear? Okay. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, somebody who keeps their promises is acting justly. Period. And notice I didn't say anything about why they're keeping their promises. So justice, correct, is simply a matter of external conformity to required behavior. So we have to worry about what that's going to be. So, so the doctrine of right, justice is going to be setting up that kind of system where we look at, it's going to include keeping your promises. It's going to include more than that. And it's concerned simply with making sure that our external behavior is right, is rightful, is proper. And it's not concerned with what the motive is, what the incentive is. Let me go on and then see if there are more questions about this. So uh, that's the example. The giving of the law that promises agreed to must be kept lies not in ethics but in justice. Lies in the doctrine of right. All that ethics teaches is that if the incentive which juridical law-giving connects with that duty, namely external constraint, were absent, then the idea of duty by itself would be sufficient as an incentive. OK, so what morality then adds to that is that, so we start with justice saying it's a requirement that you keep your promises. I don't care why. As long as you do what you promised, you're good enough from the point of view of justice. Morality then says, well, you have to keep your promises in order to be a virtuous person. You have to act rightfully. But you have to do it in order to be a virtuous person. You have to do it because you recognize that's what right is. That's what is required in order to be just. So somebody who keeps their promise under a coercive threat so somebody who fears being punished if they violate their agreement. Right? They fear being punished if they were to break their promise. And so based on that fear, they keep their promise. On the one hand, their action is just from the point of view of justice. They're perfectly fine. They haven't violated any rights. On the other hand, from the point of view of morality, they haven't acted because they recognize that that's what justice requires. They've acted that way because they're fearful of being punished. So here's a case where somebody would be acting in accordance with what justice requires, but not virtuously. And the upshot of this, there are a couple implications of this, but one is, um, to notice that, uh, so actually let me just um, continue here, um, the end of that paragraph, he says, it's no duty of virtue to keep one's promises, but a duty of right, to the performance of which one can be coerced. Like the threat of punishment for violating your promise can get somebody to keep their promise, and therefore fulfill their duty. But it is still a virtuous action to do it even where no coercion may be applied. So keeping your promise even when you are not afraid of being punished, but simply because you recognize that's what justice requires, that's virtue. The doctrine of right and the doctrine of virtue are therefore distinguished not so much by their different duties as the difference in their law giving, the source of the law giving. Um, So one important implication of this is that we need to start on things with the doctrine of right. We need to first identify